Welcome, everybody. We're continuing on our series of World War II interview series with Hudson Falls High School Social Studies teacher, Matthew Roselle. Won't you please join me? In We're so grateful to Matthew for being willing to do this series with us. And today we're, we're moving on and doing the battle for Okinawa. And we have as our panelists Richard Pearsall. Al Quinn was supposed to be here, but uh, he can't make it today. Larry Hay in the middle. And Stan Avey on the end. Enjoy the program. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Matt Roselle. You probably know me by now. I'm a history teacher at Hudson Falls High School. And uh, we're here with these three gentlemen because they were participants in the Second World War, particularly in the uh, Pacific Theater. And they were all associated one way or another with, obviously, the U.S. And we thought that today we focus on... which began on Easter Sunday, I believe, in 1945, which is also <coughs> April Fool's Day. It was April 1st, 1945. The battle raged for <clears throat> until June 22nd when the island was declared secure, and uh, it was at a very high price paid by the Americans. Over 7,600 were killed or missing in action. Over 55,000 were wounded. Uh, several interviews that I've done in the past with uh, local veterans, Marines, and Army, and Navy men were so focused on this battle that <clears throat> the war, when it ended in Europe, was just like a footnote for them. The war in Europe against the Nazis ended on May 8th, victory in Europe. But they had a battle that had to be won and fought. Many of them were also thinking ahead to the inevitable, which would have been the invasion of the Japanese home islands. Okinawa was one of the largest islands. It was the largest island that was invaded by U.S. forces towards the close of the war. It was 330 miles away from Tokyo. And that was a crucial battle because it would also allow us to uh, field 800 heavy bombers for the final assault on the Japanese home islands. So today we have our three panelists. They were all associated with this battle in one way or another. And uh, ultimately this battle, if I have my numbers correct, 110,000 Japanese died on this, this one battle. And uh, there were a lot of Okinawan civilians who also were killed in the battle. So today I'll ask a few questions. And the general question that I start out with um, is basically I want to know the person's age here at the panel and where they were from. So I guess I'll start with um, Larry. Would you like to answer the question? Uh, when were you born and where were you, where did you live? I was born in the town of Greenwich on July 4th, 1912. You guys might have to pass the microphone around. I was born on July 4th in the town of Greenwich in 1912. Okay. I was born in the town of Greenwich in 1912. And uh, you grew up in Greenwich, did you? Uh, yes. I went to high school in Greenwich. And then later, later we moved to Argyle. Or I had a store there for, for about 35 years or so, for, <coughs> for over 30 years. Okay. How about Richard? Uh, I'm a youngster compared to Larry. I was born in 1925 uh, in uh, Lakeview, Long Island. Went to school there and that's about it for like you. Okay, I'll come back to you in a second. Pass it down to Stan. Yes, I was born uh, December 12, 
thing, then I had to talk myself into getting in the Navy. Because you had, you're supposed to have a choice of whether you can go in the Navy, Marines, or Army. But I, I requested the Navy, and I said, well, I'm three over now. And I said, one more is not going to make any difference to you. And so he stamped my papers, Navy, and that's where I ended up. Stan, how did you get into the service? How did I get in the service? Yeah, all the marks on up. Yeah. Uh, well, the timing, the timing with me was such that in December, December, uh, when the bad thing happened at December the seventh, and our president made the announcement that uh, I was at New York University as a student. Uh, to study industrial arts education. And uh, I, that's where I was at the time. And uh, yeah, what's, the, that, what's the next question? How did you get into the service, into the Navy? How did I get in? Yeah. Well. Did you sign up? Uh, no, first I had to, I had to uh, go to the draft board. The draft board, I mean, may remember that. And the draft board gave me permission to, to take the final semester in, in, in New York University. And thereby, I would be, I would complete uh, and have a degree uh, and be eligible to apply for officer training. Okay, did you become an officer? Pardon? Did you become an officer? Yes, ultimately it took it took a while. It took took some time. Yeah. Uh, first, first of all I had to complete my uh, complete that and by that time it was 1940 42. Was it 42? Yeah, 42. And uh, uh, ultimately, uh, I I, uh, I I apply. I uh, what, what was it? Uh, yeah. We you said you were on a troop ship. Cathedral, and that's where 
they have the, the ceremonies. And when 19, uh, 1980 commissioned as ensigns upon graduation. And I have the picture from the newspaper showing the whole picture inside of the of the of the of the, of the church. And, uh, and then then after I was concerned about where where are they going to send me? I, I was worried. What are they, what, what, when are they going to send me? Where are they going to send me? You know? And uh, it was pretty rough over in Europe. That was very rough there. And, and uh, now, now since the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Pacific thing happened with, with the attack, then, then they needed people for that. So that's why uh, I, I, applied, I, I applied for that. And then, then upon it, uh, I, I, all right. Then, then I had to wait, and the government, the government, uh, put me on a train in December, uh, in November. No, that was November, uh, and uh, put me on a train at Grand Central Station, and uh, to travel out to the out to the to San Francisco to, to meet my ship. And uh, I, I got on the train, and it was for three nights, three nights on the plane, and on the train, and four days. That's how long the trip took. Three nights and four days on the train. Oh, OK. Yeah. It's Put it right to your mouth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. For three nights and four days. And out out in the Midwest the, the trains travel ninety miles an hour. But when it got to the mountains out in Nevada, it and and, the, and uh, uh, out that way, uh, it had to go up the mountains in a curve and it was all snow on the mountains at that time. It was beautiful. And uh, <laughs> Can I stop you here for a minute? All right. You know what? I'll help you move it along. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit stuck. Yeah, okay. Who would you like to Larry. I don't want to see you. Okay, the, the question is uh, okay, now you're in the Navy. How did you get to the Pacific Theater? What kind of ship were you on? What was your job, basically? After I got in the Navy, I was sent to uh, Samson training, and uh, after the basic training, I was assigned to a 16-week school for quartermasters, and uh, in October, we graduated from there, and was, every, our class was split up from and there was about six of us that were assigned to the uh, amphibious forces. And uh, we were sent <coughs> we were sent down to Bradford for more training. And they put our down there their, our crew was assembled and we trained there for oh, a few weeks and I think it was about Christmas time we got out of there as a crew and sent to uh, Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh, uh, the American Bridge was building LSTs, and we were assigned to this LST. And uh, while we were there, we started up our cutter maps and so forth, and for things for uh, navigation lined up for where we were going. And the, from there, we went, once the ship was launched, we went, a crew, put, not our crew, but a pilot stuck her down to the river, and it was commissioned in New Orleans. And uh, we, as once we were commissioned, then we took a shakedown cruise over to Florida, back, and then we loaded with the 
in Biloxi, Mississippi, with uh, large pylons or uh, poles, poles they were. And then they put on, uh, on, the, on our deck, uh, there were pontoons, like for bridges or docks. And that was our old, and then they loaded some gas, and then we started going through the Panama Canal, and we got into uh, Pearl Harbor on Easter Sunday, and then we re did, they did some more fitting for the ship, and, and right after that we ended up in Okinawa. What was your job? What did you, what did you do on the ship? We took care of the maps, signaling, uh, took care of the, the log, log book for the day, and worked on the worked on the bridge, and we had to, we had to be a signalman or a navigator and whatever happened to belong. The LST was a pretty big ship. The LST. It was uh, 328 feet long, 50 feet wide. And uh, these pontoons caused a problem because when we got to, they all, I think they unloaded the pontoons in Guam, not the pontoons, but the poles in Guam. And then they, we got to Okinawa, and then we couldn't get anybody to take the pontoons off. The ones that strapped to the side, we could just cut them off with the torch, but we had them doubled high on the deck. What were the pontoons for? for they, they were for bridges or docks or whatever. I never did know what they used them for. But. So is that what your ship carried primarily to that battle? That's, that, that's what we took from the States. And then after that, we well, a little story about getting the pontoons off. We finally got a cargo ship that would come in and take them off their deck. And uh, we're, they're, they're about a little ways from us at this before noon, so they thought it'd wait till afternoon and take them off. And the Japanese always had a time of coming in about noon time or at night time, dinner time, well, time to eat. You know, it's not going to show up. But the, uh, the Japanese planes, you mean? Yeah, planes. Uh, and this one plane came down between us, and they said that, that they our gunner shot the boom off the cargo ship. <laughs> So they wouldn't take our power, the things off our deck, so we had to carry those around some more. But that was, uh, but the plane came in and landed right between us, and, but uh, nobody got hurt with it. The plane went down the water? It went down the water, and then a, then a big boom. <laughs> it blew up after it hit the water. Did your ship ever get hit? Uh, no, we missed everything. We, there was times when we'd go out in the morning and sweep up stuff off the deck that could come, come out of the air that they'd put up the night before. But uh, we never got near seriously hurt, no. Okay. Richard, can I ask you uh, on the aircraft carrier what your job was? Uh, yes. Uh, my job was a yellow shirt. Now, that doesn't say anything to you, but every job on the aircraft carrier had a color. You wore a shirt and a little cloth helmet, and it was either yellow, red, green, blue, brown, white, or purple. And each one of those people had their own specific job. Now, the yellow shirts uh, usually become a yellow shirt after they have worked on the other one of the other jobs for a period of time. Uh, originally, I was a tractor driver, and then they graduated me to a yellow shirt. Now, a yellow shirt has been uh, declared the most dangerous job on Earth, especially on a World War II carrier. They're still very dangerous today. And our job was, there was about five or six of us, our job was to, we ran the flight deck, uh, we directed the planes uh, from where they were parked uh, to the catapults or to a deck launch position or to an elevator. And there are 
75 or 100 airplanes with uh, whirling propellers that you have to be conscious of and you have to watch everyone else to make sure they're conscious of it. The uh, yellow shirts were also the cops. A yellow shirt doing flight quarters, was, he had, uh, he was r actually rated higher than an officer. He had the, the highest rating as far as giving directions. During flight quarters, I could tell a lieutenant commander or a commander who was in the wrong place, sir, you can't be there. You had to do it respectfully, you know, because one th the eventually flight quarters is going to be over, and then it's his chance. Real world. But uh, the aircraft, uh, like you see today, on you see it in the on television, they're jet engines. Now they're very dangerous too, because you can get sucked into the front of one of these things, just like those birds. But you don't get behind a jet, you just can't be there. But on off-flight deck, with the propellers, you had to work behind those airplanes that were taking off. And the, actually the prop blast could pick you right off your feet and blow you into a propeller. That's why we had to watch the people who weren't supposed to be there because they didn't know how to handle themselves in, in that situation. That was takeoff and then landing uh, my position in landing was, I, you, you see them how they catch the cables. Today they have three cables, then we had 12 cables, because it was a diff totally different situation. Uh, and we could land them 18 seconds apart if everybody did their job. They can't even do that today yet. But uh, airplane landing in World War II on an aircraft carrier was really a controlled crash. Uh, and we had a lot of crashes and a lot of landings. I was there for over 20,000 landings. Wow. And uh, I was, uh, the planes landed probably 40 feet from me. Did you uh, see, you said you witnessed some crashes there? Were people killed in any of these accidents? Yes, we had uh, Airplane SB2C had over 400 modifications after the Navy accepted it, and it was a death trap. The pilots, uh, actually they were given to the British first, and the British didn't even want to fly them. So we had to fly them, and uh, they, they, were, they crashed an awful lot and killed an awful lot of people. I don't know for sure, but I always say that SB2C lost more people in operations than the enemy actually shot down. Do you remember any nighttime landings? I mean, oh, must yeah. have done those. Yes, we had, uh, we operated 12 aircraft all the time, and we had 12 night fighters that were in the air at night. And they landed at night without any lights. The ship, none of the ships out there had lights on, total darkness. And uh, the landing signal officer, he just had paddles that were fluorescent. And, uh, they shone a particular color light on him, and you could see his paddles. And that the pilot was landing absolutely. He saw nothing. He just saw darkness and a man and a couple of paddles waving around. And they uh, worked out pretty well. There must have been some situations where they missed the cable or couldn't couldn't land because the seas are too rough, maybe. Well, you had these twelve cables, and in front of the twelve cables, there were there were three barriers. The barriers would come up and they held the cables up about eight feet off the deck. So if you missed a cable, you just plowed headlong into these barriers. And a lot of times the, the uh, aircraft would come back and they'd be pretty well shot up. They wouldn't have flaps or they wouldn't have the proper controls. The ailerons and their rudder would be all shot up and they would come in like a drunken sailor and they would bounce and miss the cables and crash into the barrier and some of those crashes did cause people to be killed. Stan? <clears throat> yes. Tell me what kind of ship you were on in the war in the Pacific. What kind of ship were you on? Ship? <clears throat> my, my ship was uh, the USS Wharton, W-H-A-R-T-O-N. It was named after uh, an adjutant of the Marine Corps. It's named after him. 
And uh, my ship was built at Brooklyn, New York, and uh, uh, it used to be a, a, an ocean liner that went down to South America, and the government took over the ship, and, and then it was converted uh, to the troop ship. They had to do all the conversion. Now, the Wharton was uh, all steel and uh, rivet riveted. You might remember that the uh, Taconic, <coughs> the Taconic, that, that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the cruise ship where they had the trouble with the steel. Uh, right, they had the steel because the steel was made too brittle. And this, this lady in England, who later became a prime minister, she was a, uh, a, 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 a a, a, a chemist. She was like a chemist, uh, and, and she was an expert. And she was the one that finally told what was wrong with the with the tectonic when it hit the iceberg. Titanic. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Wharton was built after that, of course, and it was all with rivets, rivets. And, uh, and the plates, the plates were about five, five eighths of an inch thick, and they used to overlap, and so on. The ship was 600, 620 feet long, 72 foot beam across, and it drew 28 feet of water. And up at the bow there was a pencil mark that showed the footage of the, of the, of the ship while it was in the water. There was a number on there, up to, and our ship drew 28 feet. In other words, 28 feet of the ship was underwater. The rest of the ship was above water. And uh, so again, the ship was 72 feet wide, and then it was, and it had one stack, it had, uh, Two, two engines, two engines and a, two propellers to draw, but it, draw, it, it, it required a, a, a crude oil, crude oil, and a, 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 to power the ship. What did the ship carry? What? When you were in the Pacific, what did the ship carry? Did it carry men? What did it carry? I want to know what was the job of your ship, what did it do? Oh, what did it do? Did it carry troops to battle? Yeah, we, we were a troop ship, a troop ship. We had to carry the troops out and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. And uh, it was a, basically a troop ship. Now we carried 2,000 troops, 2,000 troops, and 500 crew, crew members. And, uh, uh, do you remember any uh, risks? What was the big risk in the Pacific? When you were carrying the troops, were you attacked? Any submarines? Oh yes, yes. Now, uh, when I started out, I started out, I, uh, when I finally got aboard, this is interesting, when I got aboard the ship in January of, of 43 or 4, uh, a buddy of mine, we, we were there, <coughs> we were going to school together, and they said, the captain wants to see you. So we went up to the captain's cabin, and he said, welcome aboard, you fine young fellows. He said, however, what you learn in school, forget it. <laughs> you, will, you will get an instruction each day by senior officers in the wardroom and keep an instant journal. And that was our introduction to the ship. <laughs> so in the beginning I was, uh, I was uh, like an assistant to one of the officers uh, under training. And then gradually, of course, uh, later on I, I did advance and so on. Yeah. All right. Does that answer that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Larry, can I ask you a question? Can you pass the mic to Larry, Stan? 
Okay, when you were on the LST, um, do you actually remember the battle? I mean, do you remember going in or landing any materials on the shore and your support role during the battle? Well, the first, the first second day we were there, we really shot down our first plane. That was the only one we really got credit for. But uh, there was almost every day there would be a red alert. And uh, if I start firing, putting metal in the air, to, and I don't never know what they were shooting at, but uh, they just put up an umbrella of steel and <laughs> hope for the best. Uh, They, uh, we we uh, carried stuff, things around the Okinawa. We went from one side to the other, and uh, I remember one day we were beached on the east side, and the I think it was the old New Yorker battleship, and they were off the shore, and they were. Down in the hills of Okinawa, because the, their own place was honeycombed with the Japanese, and the only way they could get them out was blast them out, or the Navy was uh, fire flame flamethrowers too. But uh, and we sat there, and the, the little Piper Cub would come over and sail around and then he'd go back and then they'd blow another few blow more blasts going on. Uh, we were we were up to Evil, that was where Ernie Pyle was killed. It was a little island just north of Okinawa. And that was I well, that was a stance there. It was what? It was it was so, there was so many burning bodies there that Really re reeked. A stash. And we were, and we were beached there overnight. There were several of us there, and, and then they come down there dropping bombs. Right, boom, boom, boom. We just sat there. Nobody, nobody got hit, and I know, of, but they they missed us all. Do you remember when Ernie Powell got killed? When? Do you remember? When he got, I know he got killed on Okinawa, but do you remember? Well, it was on Evil, which is a little island just north of Okinawa. It, uh, I don't remember the date or anything because we. Well, when you got the news, you, you were you aware that? Well, while you were there. Were you aware that he was killed? Uh, yes, yes, we were. But uh, then after that, we went. Back to Okinawa and then in August, the, the um, it, it, when the peace came, well, they dropped the bomb, and that was a lifesaver for many, many people, for Americans and Japanese alike. But uh, in our part, uh, the next week we start, went back to the Philippines, loaded up with people from the European War, and then we, all the LSTs gathered and we went uh, as a regular, uh, same orders we would head before the invasion had taken place before. Right. But, uh, and then we, we ended up in Yokohama. And un unloaded the one of the one of the groups we had aboard ship was uh, the uh, took over Tokyo Rosa's uh, <coughs> radio spot where she was broadcasting all the propaganda from. I think there were six guys in that crew that was uh, take over that radio station. Okay. I'll ask you about that in a minute. Can I ask a Richard question? <clears throat> Yeah, during the battle, the battle for Okinawa, naturally speaking, do you remember, um, you know, being on in the vicinity with the aircraft carrier and, and such? What were you, what were you guys doing there? 
Well, of course, we were uh, launching Aquip. Uh, the normal procedure was uh, readily at 2 o'clock in the morning. And just before sunrise, the uh, first flights would go up, and you'd be at flight quarters all day long. And it would be uh, 10, 11 o'clock at night before you, all the planes were secured. But uh, at one point, the kamikazes, I think everyone knows what a kamikaze is, a suicide plane. But there were times when they come out 200 at a time. And uh, the task force, uh, the carriers, were surrounded by, the, the carriers were the main targets. There was a lot of them hit at Okinawa. We lost uh, 35 ships at Okinawa and uh, over 350 were damaged to the, a lot of them damaged to the point where they had to be scrapped. But uh, we had pick, what they call picket boats. They were out uh, maybe 35, 40 miles from the, from the main task force and they surrounded us and so you always knew when the kamikaze was coming. The picket boats would get some of them, but they flew very, very high. And they were untrained pilots, and they weren't very successful at all. Uh, Japanese lost about 8,000 airplanes, and probably uh, three quarters of those were kamikazes, and I, I think their, their uh, score must have been about 2%. But uh, the uh, uh, what was it? Bunker Hill was right behind us and got hit with two uh, kamikazes within 30 seconds. It didn't sink, but it burned uh, uh, quite heavily. They also had a, uh, we called it the back of bomb, but it, that's not what the Japanese called it. Uh, Baka in Japanese means stupid, so we call it the stupid bomb. Uh, it actually hung up below a, a, a Betty. The Betty uh, was a bomber that the Japanese had. It was a complete, exact copy of our B-26. They would carry this Baka bomb underneath that thing, and a, a young boy would fly it. It had a rocket motor, but they would drop it, and he would glide it in like a uh, like a glider but at any point where it was advantage to him he could light off that rocket and the thing would really speed up but they were also very inaccurate and uh, probably because of the inexperienced pilots they had but uh, the kamikazes they got to a point where anything that would fly they they would use a kamikaze and the ships had uh, five-inch guns for anti-aircraft, and they had uh, 40 millimeters for anti-aircraft and 20 millimeters for anti-aircraft. When the five-inch were going off, you knew he was really high and far away. So you might not even look. You hear the 40s going off, and then you're going to look because he's getting closer. And when you hear the 20s going off, then you really better take cover. But uh, we did very well out there, and if, I think Larry alluded to it, if we ever had a land uh, on Japanese homeland, on the Japanese island, it would have been absolute suicide. Uh, they had thousands of kamikazes, boats, and everything else at Okinawa, and on the homeland, I'm sure they had tens, tens of thousands of of uh, kamikazes, and it would have been it would have been a terrible thing. Do you remember about the atomic bomb, or where you were when you heard it, or heard of it? Yes, we heard, uh, heard of the atomic bomb. Uh, I guess shortly after it went off, and uh, it was kind of mixed emotions. We didn't know exactly uh, how much damage it had done, but. Uh, I don't know how much the bomb did, but I had I had liberty in Tokyo uh, about a week after the treaty was signed, and uh, actually we were, we were part of the uh, occupation army, and the devastation there was there was nothing standing in Tokyo, nothing just just you would if it was a bank you'd see the vault would be 
be standing there and you may see a fireplace, but everything was just flat. In Tokyo, Tokyo was actually uh, hit with incendiary bombs, I think it was in March 1945, killed 100,000 people, actually more than the first atomic bomb, the second one too. So Tokyo was absolutely leveled. Actually, uh, on the Battle of Okinawa, more people were killed in both atomic bombs put together. There's, uh, uh, Mr. Rosell alluded to the Army losing 100,000 or 150,000. There was as many civilians that died there, maybe 100,000. They actually don't know because they were buried alive in the caves. A lot of caves on Okinawa and a lot of people buried alive. A lot of people committed suicide. They had a cliff there that was the favorite place to jump off. President died, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, yes. When, uh, yes. when he died, yes. Uh, what did you feel when he died? Yes, yes, yes. yes. He died in April 1945. Yeah. The battle broken out. It was just getting underway. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I, I, uh, well how did I feel? Well, everybody was sad. Magnetic and it would blow up the minesweeper. So for that reason, it had to be 